Good morning. Welcome to our morning service. Uh, lovely to see uh, the church so full. Uh, welcome to you if you're visiting with us as well. Uh, many of you will know that uh, today is the baptism service of Isla, uh, our own daughter, and so her grandpa is going to take the service today, Reverend Angus McRae from the Free North in Inverness. Uh, so that baptism is going to take place very near the start of the service. Um, so we'll have uh, one of the singings and a prayer and then the baptism will happen uh, then. So after we sing after the baptism, then the young ones can make their way to Sunday School of Fresh. Uh, just another few notices. Uh, again, we meet the, this evening at 5 p.m. I'll be taking that service. And then after the evening services, uh, there will be uh, the Youth Fellowship and we'll be at Rod and Emma's house. So we'll meet there to start at 7.45. Uh, so that will be uh, at Rod and Emma's and one of our own members, uh, one of our own teenagers who's gone off to uni, uh, Sam McNeil, is going to uh, share a bit of testimony uh, with us. Uh, just the Sutherland Convention's been going on this weekend up in Dornoch. Uh, so tonight will be the last night if you want to go after the evening service. So it's at 8 p.m. in Dornoch Academy if you'd like to attend that. Uh, and just let me invite you to stay for tea and coffee and cake uh, through in the hall. Uh, last week, you may have noticed if you saw some of the stuff online, uh, we celebrated as a congregation um, 10 years of ministry for Alistair and Mary uh, here in Tain and Fern Free Church. So they got a cake, uh, but I knew that there was a cake coming today here in Hilton. Uh, so Isla's baptism cake is here for you all to have and eat. So please come through to the hall after the service. I'll just hand over to Angus. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be with you today, and may the Lord bless us as he meets with us in his house this morning. It's lovely to see you all and to see so many uh, children in this gathering as well. As we lift up our hearts to God, uh, a verse of Scripture that I want to use to focus our minds, a call to worship comes from uh, psalm 149 we'll we'll finish our service with that psalm but that psalm begins praise the lord sing to the lord a new song his praise in the assembly of the godly let israel be glad in his maker let the children of zion rejoice in their king old and young children of the living god Let's raise our voices in praise to God as we sing Psalm 100 from the Scottish Psalter to God's praise. In the Blue Song Book, you'll find it on page 362, Psalm 100, the first version, all people that on earth do dwell. Let's praise God in Psalm 100. on earth to Yeah. 
singing. Well, we come to God in our prayers now. Let us pray. Almighty, gracious, loving God, we draw near to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and the only Savior. There is no other name that you have given among human beings by which we may be saved. And you ask that we would come that we would trust in the Lord and in his Son, Jesus Christ, that we might have life, eternal life. We ask that we would praise you as our opening psalm. It called the whole of creation, the whole earth, to adore you and to bless you and to know you. We pray from the youngest child in this gathering to the oldest person, that we would be touched by your hand of love and grace and protection. We live in a day of change and of stress and of anxiety and of fear for so many people in a troubled world. But this earth belongs to you. So we commend all our fears and troubles to the sovereign Lord God, we commend to you those who are sick and suffering. We commend to you loved ones who are in any trouble or trial or danger. We commend to you the nations of the world. They need the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. Bring an end to conflict and fighting around the world with righteousness and justice. Especially, we remember the situation in Ukraine, and we ask that you would turn aside those with wicked hearts and with violence in their minds, and that you would defeat those who wish to hurt the weak and the innocent. Have mercy, O oh God. We pray your grace in Pakistan, where there is such terrible suffering and flooding, and where hope and livelihoods have been drowned by the unseasonable rains that have come. Again, Lord, we pray for your mercy and that there would be provision for all who call on your name and ask for your help. And help the world to be full of compassion for places where there is need and trouble and devastation. We ask that the gospel of Christ will ring out with clarity and power around the whole earth today and that many hundreds and thousands will come into the kingdom of God, putting their trust in Jesus Christ. We pray for this gathering and the gatherings along the road in Tain and for the work and witness of this congregation and of every gospel church in this area. Pour out your Holy Spirit and bring new life and renewal and revival. Make us open and teachable to your word today. And as we see your word in a gospel sacrament, a sign of the good news, may we respond to your word, your word read, your word explained and taught and applied, and your word demonstrated in the sign of baptism. And bless the family who are coming with their little one today, asking for God's grace to be good and wise and faithful, God-fearing parents, and for God's grace for their child. 
Lord, be the father that Isla needs and that all the children in this church need. Be the savior that she needs, the Lord who calls her name and give her a heart to love and respond to you from the very beginning of her days. May all the children and young people in this gathering be full of your wisdom and light and truth. And may none of our little ones stray from you or be lost, but may all be found in Jesus Christ and in his covenant love, both now and in the life that is to come. May we know you and follow you, for the good shepherd has a clear and beautiful voice, and his sheep know his voice, and they will follow him. So, good shepherd, speak to us now and lead us for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to read to you the words at the end of Matthew's gospel that are a great reason for having a baptism service today. They're known as the Great Commission in Matthew 28 from verse 16. Jesus gathered the apostles who would lead the church onto a mountain in Galilee. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. This is God's word the word of the Lord. I want to speak to you about baptism before I ask Andrew and Ailey to come forward with Isla to receive the sign of baptism for their child. I want to explain what baptism is all about. Jesus told his followers, his disciples, that he wanted them to go and teach and make disciples, followers, who would learn about Jesus and follow him, grow in faith, and that they would be baptized as a sign that they belonged to his kingdom and the coming age. Baptism in water must mean something. So what is it all about? Quickly, four things about baptism. Number one, are you counting? Baptism is a sign of washing and belonging. We use water in baptism, and we use water for lots of things, but the main thing we would use water for is to wash things, to have a bath, to clean the house, and what have you. Baptism did not appear out of nothing in the Bible. When John the Baptist, and then Jesus, and then Jesus' disciples went about baptizing people It was not a new thing. There had been baptisms in the Old Testament. And water is very important in the story of God and his people in the Old Testament. Water that comes to symbolize belonging to Jesus and following Jesus in the New Testament. Water is there in creation. God divided water from land in the very beginning and provided rivers in the creation to bring fresh water into the world so that people and animals could live. There was chaos and God brought order into the chaos and water being divided and separated was part of that. But sin came into the world, the fall, and so the waters of the flood came, waters of 
judgment, but also waters of cleansing. That's all in the first few pages of the Bible. And you move on to the story of Israel and of their rescue by God and being set up as a separate holy nation and kingdom, the story of Exodus. And it's through water that Israel is freed from slavery and they go through the waters of the Red Sea and they are born as a new people, rescued, bought, redeemed, and in a sense cleansed from Egypt and their idols as they go through the sea and they are taken onto the other side. And, and that's repeated when they cross the River Jordan to go into the land of Canaan. They go through the waters to become God's people in God's land. The prophets spoke about water. Prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah and the New Covenant, and they talked about God sprinkling us, washing us, giving us new hearts, washing us not just outwardly, but inwardly, and giving life and renewal. Water gives life. And God, as he saves us, will wash us and give life to us. When we repent of sin, believe the promises, we are washed, we are holy, we are clean. Jesus tells us that we are to receive baptism as his followers. And in the New Testament, Paul tells the church, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You've taken his name on himself, on yourself. Now take the sign of baptism. Baptism is a sign of washing and of belonging. It was for Israel and it is for the church. That was number one. Number two, baptism replaces Old Testament circumcision as the sign of belonging. The sign that God is our God, that we are his people before Jesus, was that the believers, the boys, the males, had a sign in their body. A little bit of their skin was cut away as a sign they were coming in to God's people. And that sign has been changed through the gospel to be a sign for men and women, boys and girls, not involving part of your body being removed, but the sign of water baptism. I hope we're all very comfortable with that change. I think in many ways it's a much easier uh, change to accommodate. Paul explains how circumcision and baptism mean the same thing when he writes in Colossians 2, and he says the truth of circumcision is the same truth of baptism. He says to the church in Colossae, in him, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. It wasn't a physical super circumcision. It was a spiritual circumcision. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off, cut off, taken away when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. And he goes on to talk about faith. Circumcision symbolized faith in God's promise, and baptism symbolizes faith in God's promise. The meaning of circumcision and baptism is the same, but God has moved his people on from outward signs in our bodies to a sign that speaks of an inward circumcision, a circumcision of our hearts, and it is symbolized by the use of water in baptism. So number one and number two, we thought about number three. Baptism is a sign of belonging for believers and their children. We belong to God and to each other and to God's church. Now, every Christian, I think, agrees that it's good to baptize a grown-up, an adult who believes in Jesus. And if somebody in this gathering has come to faith in Jesus 
and you've never been baptized, it's a wonderful and powerful thing as an adult to say, I believe, I follow Jesus, and so in obedience, I take the sign of baptism on myself as a sign of faith and discipleship. But the question that has sometimes divided Christians is whether that sign should be extended to the children of believers as well. Are our children inside or outside the family of God? Do they belong under the sign of belonging or not? That's not an easy thing to answer because not all Christians have agreed on it. But let me give you the best answer that I can. Church history suggests that from the earliest days, the Christian church gave the sign of baptism to children of believers. It was done in the second century. It was done in the second generation of Christians. What would have made them do that if it was not done in the first century, in the first generation of believers? It'd be a very strange thing to change around about the year 100 AD, if it hadn't been happening in 90 or 80 or 70 AD, it would be very strange that the church changed something and that they would write about it, preach about it, and that it would not be controversial. So church history says, yes, the children are on the inside of God's plans and God's church. They're not strangers to God. They're growing up with God. But then there's an answer from the Old Testament. The children were included in God's family in the Old Testament. Circumcision that I've already talked about was given to the children of God's people when they were just days old. Anyone coming into Israel could be circumcised at any age, but their children would be circumcised a few days after they were born. And so the Old Testament seems to be on the side of treating the children of believers as being part of the people of God, not strangers to God, but part of God's family. We still need our hearts to be circumcised. We still need to be born again. We still need personal faith. But the sign of belonging to God belongs to all those who are hearing the gospel and growing up with the gospel. So that's the answer from history and from the Old Testament. And what about the New Testament? I don't have a verse that says you must baptize your children. But I have plenty of verses in the New Testament that say that when people became Christians, when people became believers, when the book of Acts was being written and Paul's letters were being written, we read about household baptisms. The Philippian jailer or Lydia, they became believers, and everyone in their household, everyone under their roof, is treated as part of a Christian house, a believing house from that time on. The servants who lived with the family, the children who lived with the family, they're part of the household. The household receives the sign that this house belongs to God. God is king in this house. So that's three things that I've suggested to you today about baptism. And the last one is that baptism is a sign of belonging that calls for faith and that calls for prayer. We should be responding to God's grace in the gospel by trusting God and asking for his salvation and for his grace. We don't believe in rituals. We don't believe in superstition. We don't believe in magic. Water in baptism will not make an adult or a child a Christian, but it will recognize the gospel promises to that person, adult or child, that all who come to God in faith will receive forgiveness and eternal life. Let's treat this little child who receives baptism today 
as one that God is claiming for his own. And let's bring her up in the nurture and teaching of the Lord, in the love of the Lord, to know God as her God, Jesus as her Savior. And let's pray that she and all the boys and girls who've received this sign will never walk away from God and what the sign of baptism says and means. May God bless these words and these thoughts today. I'm going to invite Andrew and Ailey to come forward. And in a minute, I'll ask you all to stand, and I'm going to put questions to the parents, but I'll also put a question to you, inviting you to pray for and support this family and all the families who have baptized children among you. And the answer I'm looking from, for from you is that we will say together, with God's help, we do. Okay? With God's help, we do. Okay. I've got some questions for you. The last time I put questions to you, you were getting married. And I'm very glad to see that's working out well. And uh, that you have some real blessings that you share in. Andrew and Ailey, do you acknowledge the Bible to be the word of God and your only guide in all matters of faith and conduct? Do you confess God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as revealed in Scripture, to be your God? Do you profess faith in Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinners and as your Savior and Lord? And do you promise in dependence on God's help by your prayers, teaching, and example to bring up your child, Isla Ann, in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. In congregation, people of God, do you undertake to uphold these parents in their responsibility to nurture this child of God's covenant in the Christian faith? Do you promise to help them by your love, prayers, and example? With God's help, we do. Thank you. I invite you all to stand. Gracious God, be with us in this moment when we ask for your nearness and your blessing and for the action of your Holy Spirit in all our hearts. As we baptize this child of your covenant, we ask that all of us will be enrolled in your covenant and that none of us will walk away from the love of Jesus Christ revealed in the gospel. For all who have been baptized, may this be a moment of confirming our baptism, our need of you and our faith. And especially for these parents, we ask that they will know more of your love, more of your help, more of your joy, and that wonderful sense that God is close and answering prayer. Grant your love, your eternal, your everlasting love to surround this family and their beautiful child. May this daughter be a daughter of God. May this child whom you love be loved evermore in the love that sent Jesus to the cross for sinners. May grace be upon her and on us all. Help us now to act in faith for your glory. Amen. Taking ordinary water, a sign of the Holy Spirit, a sign of washing, a sign of new life, a sign of judgment and of forgiveness. I baptize you, Isla Anne MacLeod, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord grant his peace to you.
Lord, keep this little one whom we love as the apple of your eye and love her evermore. And bless the boys, the girls, the young people, the men and women here. And bless Andrew and Ailey. Bind us together in your love. Bless the grandparents who are here and great-grandparents. And may all of us know joy from Jesus. Amen. Good girl. God bless you. What a good girl. Yes. I don't normally kiss babies when I baptize them, but I blow you a kiss. Good girl. Good girl. We're going to sing from Psalm 34. In Sing Psalms, Psalm 34, in Sing Psalms. And we'll begin at verse 7. Is that right? Verse 8, Psalm 34, at verse 8. Come, taste and see, the Lord is good, who trusts in him is blessed. Psalm 34, verses 8 to 14, we'll stand to sing. I hope you have a good time through in your groups. And for the rest of us, we're going to read some passages from God's Word, uh, mostly from the book of Deuteronomy, beginning in Deuteronomy chapter 4. So we're in Deuteronomy and in chapter 4 at verse 9. Just short readings today from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. And we read there, Only be careful... 
and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. And then turning on about a page in the Bible to chapter 6, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Very famous passage. We call this the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the daily prayer of Jewish people morning and evening. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, and so on. And a final reading from Deuteronomy, a few pages on in chapter 11, Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And a final reading from the New Testament, from Ephesians chapter 6. Paul writing to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, his advice for children and their parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Amen. May God bless these readings of his own word. We're going to sing again from Sing Psalms, Psalm 78. Sing Psalms, Psalm 78, at the beginning, the verses 1 to 6. O oh, my people, hear my teaching, parables I will unfold. Sing Psalms 78 on page 101.
of our time this morning, I'd like to reflect with you on our readings from Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 6 and 11 and from Ephesians chapter 6 to try and answer a question which I hope you will see as a, a valuable question, an important question for all of us who are here. And that question is, how will our children meet God? How Will our children meet God? I realize as I begin that some of you may be thinking, well, that's got nothing to do with me. I don't have children, or I'm unlikely to have children. You might be a single person, or you might uh, never have had a family of your own. But we are a company of men and women today who are in Jesus Christ. We are the family of God in this place. And there's a sense in which these boys and girls that are sitting in this gathering and through in the Sunday school are our boys and girls. They belong to our Heavenly Father. He gave them life. And we are entrusted with their spiritual health and welfare and care. When you pray for them, you're treating them as God's children and your children. When you encourage them and teach them and love them, when you help them to go to camp or encourage them to be in a youth fellowship or in a Sunday school, you are helping them to meet with God, whether they're your children or grandchildren or not. So this is relevant to all of us. How will our children meet God? First thing I want to say about this is that they will meet God in godly families. Our children will meet God in godly families. It's been a real privilege for me today as a grandfather to baptize a grandchild. This is a whole new thing for me. I am so enjoying being a grandfather. I look forward to my Monday day off my wife has a Monday day off, so it's not a day off. It's a day to do anything we can to support the project that is Little Isla and to try and help our mum and dad in any way we can. And even if it's not a Monday, any excuse, it's marvellous and it's lovely that Andrew's parents can come over for this weekend and be part of this little granddaughter's life for this weekend. They are experts at being grandparents. Uh, Anne and myself, we're just real beginners. But I look forward to being part of a family of this growing little child. And somebody in the family took a photo of me holding the baby a few days ago. And what do you do with these photos? They go online, and one of my good friends, another minister, obviously saw a resemblance of some sort. Maybe Isla was looking really grumpy at that moment, but his comment was, oh, the blood is strong. The blood is strong. There's a resemblance. There's, there's something that you've passed on. Maybe it's the eyes. Maybe I got the eyes from my mother, and I gave them to Illy, and she's given them to Isla. Do you see a resemblance sometimes? between brothers and sisters, and you maybe you, you, you meet someone, a, a cousin, 
and you, you suddenly say, well, they're so like another of their cousins, and you can see the connection. Well, when we want our people to grow up with the gospel and our children to grow up with the gospel, we want the next generation to resemble not only their fathers, their mothers, their grandparents, but to resemble the stamp of their heavenly Father, the loving Lord God, their Creator. And that's very much what Moses was stressing to the people of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was written at the end of 40 years wandering in the wilderness, preparing Israel to go into the promised land. And one of the tragedies of that is that the, the generation who left Egypt, the older generation, mostly died in the desert and were buried in the sands of Arabia. And mostly they did not make it into the promised land. Their children did. Their grandchildren did. But because they turned away from the Lord and were unfaithful, because they worshipped idols, made a golden calf, broke God's law, in their hearts wanted to go back to Egypt, they died. And they did not inherit that promise. And yet Moses, on the, on the brink of the children and the grandchildren of the Exodus people getting into the promised land, he says, I don't want you to make that mistake again. I want you to build strong and godly homes, strong and godly families, so that when you get into the, the land God has promised, you will be blessed by the Lord and not rejected by the Lord. You will have the Lord with you, strengthening you and saving you and not being against you as covenant breakers. Listen to some of the ways that they were to stay close to the Lord and meet the Lord. In Deuteronomy 4, make them known, all the wonders of God, make them known to your children and your children's children. You stood before God when he gave the law at Mount Horeb, and he said, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me and that they may teach their children so. This is to be passed on to our children. The wonders, the miracles, the giving of the covenant, the giving of the commandments. Tell your children all about it. Tell them about God. The Shema prayer that we read in Deuteronomy 6, given to the community of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. And you know, most of the language in, in that prayer, it is singular. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. But it becomes plural in one phrase. And it's that phrase in verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6 that says, you, plural, shall teach them, your children, diligently. This is the job God gives to both parents and to all Israelites. You shall love the Lord, and you together shall teach and instruct the hearts of your children so that they love the Lord with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength. I guess a lot of people here will have heard of Francis Schaeffer, who was an American minister. He came to Europe after the Second World War, he tried to spread the gospel where it had been forgotten in Europe. And he had a wife, Edith Schaefer, who was also a thinker and a writer. And in one of her articles, she wrote about what is a family. And Edith Schaefer says this, what is a family? It is a perpetual relay race of truth. I think, she says, we can see the whole race as one in which true faith is to be handed over like the flag or the baton in a relay race from generation to generation. Have you been in a relay race 
where you run your bit of the race and you hand on the flag or the bean bag or, or the baton to the next runner and they run their bit of the race and maybe they hand it on to the last runner who runs their bit of the race. What is a family, says Edith Schaefer? A family is a long race where one generation, just like Psalm 78 said, one generation takes the stories, the truth, the covenant, the law, the parables, and hands it on to their children, and they run the next bit of the race, and they hand it on to their children. That is a beautiful picture of healthy families where God is at the center, and the family is a place where we're not ashamed to talk about the Bible and the truth of the living God. What wisdom there is in that little quote. Deuteronomy 11, you shall teach them to your children. Where? When? Well, at bedtime, at bath time, at breakfast time, at lunch time, at dinner time, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. The whole of life is a teaching opportunity to model faith and discipleship. Can I be practical? Start young. Sometimes you hear people saying things like, well, I'm not sure that the children are ready to come to church yet. Well, I think they're as ready at a few weeks and a few months as they're going to be at the toddler stage or at the 14 and a half stage. When is a good time to start? As soon as possible. And if you've lost some time, well, start now, encouraging our families to think we are a, a family who love the Lord, and as a family, we are going to follow the Lord, and as a family, we are going to pray at home, read the Bible at home, and we're going to go to church, and we're going to talk about the things that really matter. It's not rocket science. Family worship, saying grace at meals, reading the Bible, society round about us is trying to catechize our boys and girls all the time to shape them into the shape of this world. It's our job in families to influence and teach and encourage and train and bless our children by bringing Jesus and his word and his gospel into their lives. So the first thing that we see today is that our children they will meet God in godly families. But the second thing is that they will meet God in godly churches. The purpose of God's salvation in the Old Testament was to gather a people. The Exodus was gathering a people, a nation. And going into the land was gathering a people to be a holy people, a worshiping people. The temple building to gather a people the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, building a people, building a church. God's word is full of the idea of the people of God gathered before God and worshiping together and learning together and strengthening and supporting one another. So we shouldn't lift something like Ephesians 6 where it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And then it quotes the commandments, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. That's not unconnected from church life. Church life should be feeding that, supporting that. And then fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's not easy. It's not easy to be a good, wise, patient dad. It's not easy to be a good, wise, patient mother. But if we have a praying, loving, supportive church around us, not a church that's criticizing us and judging us and, and, and spotting every mistake we make, but a church that's there to say, how can we help you and support you and pray for you and share your burdens? What a wonderful thing that is. Isn't that the kind of church that Ephesians is, is all about? A rich church of loving bonds. A church that is like the family. Here's a thought for you. 
let your family be like a little church and let your church be like a big family where we accept one another, we receive one another, we rejoice in one another, we share one another's good news happily and we share one another's sad news with compassion and care and genuine love. What a help it is when boys and girls see a community taking God seriously. It's not just mom and dad. It's the other moms and other dads. It's the people around us. Find a healthy church if you're not part of one already and stick with it. A healthy church takes God and his word seriously and teaches it. Go every week. Go every Lord's Day. Go as often as you can. Go morning and evening if you can. Stick with it. Now, I know that children, like grown-ups, can get bored and that they have friends who've got other exciting things they want to do. There might be wonderful dancing lessons or football matches or all kinds of other things that clash with church time on a Sunday. And sometimes our children will say, oh, I don't want to go. It's boring. Or I don't want to go. It'll make me unhappy. But on a Monday morning during school term, maybe our children don't want to go to school either. Or they don't want to go to the dentist. There's lots of things our children don't want to do. But because we're loving parents, we say, as a family, we go. And as a family, here's why we go. And here's what we're learning about God. And for the rest of the week, we have opportunities to deal with what the children are learning, what we are all learning from the songs, from the worship, from the preaching and the teaching, from the life of the community to show why God is big and God is great and God is important. There was in the third century in North Africa a follower of Jesus called Cyprian, St. Cyprian. Well, preachers in those days said some pretty strong things. And Cyprian, one of his sermons mentions parents who are more concerned about their children having physical blessings, temporary, temporal needs being met than spiritual needs and spiritual blessings being attended to. Now, we want our children to have nice things, don't we? We want them to have nice clothes and nice toys and nice houses and nice holidays, and they're, they're all good things. I can't walk past Jules without wanting to get uh, the card out and buy something for Isla. That's just the way grandparents are. But St. Cyprian said this in the 3rd century AD, a man who is more concerned about the physical and temporal needs of his child than the spiritual needs. It's like a man watching his dog drown and his child drown at the same time and choosing to save his dog. Oh boy, these old-time preachers, they said bold things, didn't they? I want my little girl, my little boy to be happy, so I'll neglect their soul. No. If your child was drowning or in danger, you would run into the sea to to try and rescue them. You would risk your own life to try and rescue them. Well, they are in a world where they are drowning spiritually, where there are dangers and enemies. So protect them, love them, by bringing them to the Lord in prayer and by showing them how to pray for themselves In one of these passages, if we'd read on, we would find that Deuteronomy says, your children will ask you questions when your son asks you in time to come, what's the meaning of these testimonies? Be ready to teach, to explain, to answer. You study the Bible so you can teach and train your children. Church, get equipped so that you can explain the faith. And when our teenagers come and say, I've got a question... They're saying in school, they're saying on YouTube, they're saying online, this, this, this. 
Is Jesus for real? Is the Bible for real? We've got answers because we are filling our souls with God's truth so that we can pass it on to the next generation. I'm finished, but I want to finish by reminding myself, by reminding the parents here and the congregation of God's people here today, we are not perfect. We are sinners. So we don't pretend to our children a perfection that we do not have. They know we struggle. And what a good thing it is to show our children that our hearts are soft and sensitive when we get it wrong and that we are learning to come back to God, to say sorry to God, and to find a path back to obedience and faithfulness. Show our next generation what it looks like to be a loving, faithful, growing disciple. And your children and your children's children will bless you in eternity that you showed them Jesus and his grace and his way. Jesus wants us to go out and baptize and make disciples and to observe all that I have commanded you. And Jesus gives you his wonderful promise. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Please bless your word to our hearts, sovereign God, and please help us to be encouraged to be families and churches that lead old ones and little ones to God. Meet us in the gospel, meet us in Jesus, and help us to be faithful, cheerful, thankful for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, shall we close with words from Psalm 149 in the Scottish Psalter, in the Psalm book, page 450, right at the end of the Psalm book, Psalm 149, verses 1 to 4. Praise ye the Lord, unto him sing a new song, and his praise, and so on. Let's stand to sing.
Gracious God, we need you. We need your grace, your mercy, and your peace. So meet us in the gospel of your Son, and try you, loving God, draw near to us, and help us in faith to draw near to you. Grace be with us evermore. Amen. Hope you can stay for tea and coffee and some of Isla's cake.